Hello and welcome friends. I'm Abhinav Pandya, your host for today's session. And once again at Usana's Foundation, we are back with an interview with one of the most brilliant scholars on the rise of religious extremism in Europe. So today we have with us uh, Dr. Charlotte. Charlotte is an assistant research fellow at Henry Jackson Society. She is a PhD candidate in Arab and Islamic studies with the University of Exeter, Exeter University. Her research focuses on minority within Muslim minority conflict in the UK, in particular, the persecution of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and the extent to which the UK is able to support the community. Dr. Charlotte Littlewood started her career as a prevent practitioner on behalf of the UK government, going on to be a counter extremism coordinator for the East London Borough. From this, Charlotte went on to found her own community interest company with the aim of countering extremism and promoting equality. She developed and took projects that focused on women's rights and tackling domestic violence to the West Bank, Palestine. Alongside this, she consulted for Muslims against anti-Semitism, working towards greater tolerance and cohesion between the communities in the UK. She has an LLB in law and masters in security and strategy. So welcome, Dr. Charlotte Littlewood. It's definitely an honor for us uh, today that you're here with us for this interesting session. You know. so Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you yes. so much for, for having me uh, today. I'm not quite a doctor yet, not quite. I'm in my final year of my PhD, but um, soon. <laughs> for us, you're more than a doctor. You already worked so much. You know, I just read that you also worked with the prevent strategy and in my first book uh, radicalization in india i discussed about this prevent strategy i'll be asking a question to you about this strategy also so let me begin with your recent report uh, britain's anti blasphemy uh, uh, police case. so can you just uh, tell us uh, you know, something in detail about this report and then we'll have more questions to you regarding this report because this blasphemy is the issue is a major concern in india too. In my city only, almost like a year back, a man was uh, slaughtered in an ISIS-style beheading over this blasphemy issue. A lady, the, Ms. Nupar Sharma, she is a member of the ruling party. In one of her interviews, she quoted something from uh, Hadith, and uh, she mentioned that Prophet Muhammad had to marry, I mean, he married a six-year-old girl. So after that, a fatwa was issued against her, and uh, she is charged of uh, all these anti-blasphemy allegations. And uh, definitely, uh, she is just you know trying to save her life now. She is in hiding. So I'd like to know more from you about your report and how is the scenario in UK. Yeah. So I mean, for for the UK, the issue around extreme anti-blasphemy agitation really came to the fore on the back of Salman Rushdie's uh, novel, Satanic Verses. Um, and I think with the protests that broke out then and then thereafter, the momentum of this movement against blasphemy, I would call it, um, what wasn't noticed or wasn't being picked up on by practitioners was really where the anti-blasphemy sentiment was coming from and the different ideologues and organizations that were sort of linking the anti-blasphemy instances. Um, so what this report did, which is sort of different to other reports that look at blasphemy, is really look at the recent instances in the UK and who has been involved and who has been pushing for anti-blasphemy action. Um, and, and that particularly sort of pointed us towards Pakistan and um, Jamati Islami and Tariq Lebeik. Um, so I, I took a, a number of recent case studies um, and they were the autistic boy who dropped a Quran at school and received death threats. Um, so you may have heard about this, this case. Um, it, the, it was resolved in the most bizarre uh, way, which really sort of paints the picture of how the UK is handling the situation and where we're going wrong. Instead of the death threats being handled and the autistic boy being supported, um, the mother of the autistic boy sat in the local mosque and put a hijab on and was um, sort of pushed to apologise um, for her son's behaviour and beg for the forgiveness of, of the Muslim community and implore that her son was now going to have lessons around um, Islam and respecting Islam. Um, and, um, and what was shocking was on this panel was a member of the police, um, a member of the local authority, um, and, and of course the, the imam. And this, this was really concerning because on a number of levels, we shouldn't have 
a, a religious institution dealing with a school matter, first of all. We shouldn't have the police, religious institution, and local authorities all sitting together on a panel and dealing with this in some kind of semi-court fashion. Um, and of course, the, the safeguarding of the autistic child was the most important uh, aspect that should have been prioritized, not the potential offense of, of, of dropping and scuffing the Quran. Um, and I think that case really sort of epitomizes the situation now in the UK. But what I did was take that case and a number of other cases that are recent and look at who's been involved in pushing against the likes of the autistic child. So who's been issuing the death threats? Who's been saying that the, the person should apologize or the school should apologize? Um, and all the persons involved are linked to uh, Khatmein Abawit, Tariq Lebeik, um, calling for the death of blasphemers and, and the various ideologies that's emanating from Pakistan. Uh, so my recommendations really were around understanding this, understanding that these are all connected um, and understanding that we shouldn't have visiting extreme preachers from Pakistan preaching in the mosques in the UK. And we shouldn't have organizations like Hartman about existing and having charities here in the UK, allowing for the inroads of this ideology, essentially. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I really wonder, I mean, I would like to know more about uh, the Pakistan connection I and mean, how much it is uh, being routed through Pakistan, the financial networks and uh, also the role of, you know, uh, Pakistani clerics in the ideological indoctrination. And the another dimension of this issue, how far this you know, sentiment for the a very strong sentiment on the blasphemy issue is prevalent among the common and ordinary Muslims living in the UK? Yeah, I think um, this is an interesting question. How much does this link to Pakistan? And I think for the UK, very much um, uh, to a large extent. Yes, there have been incidences defending against blasphemy that have been related to Iran. Um, and we had the Lady of Heaven. We had a film that was considered to be problematic because it depicted a different Shia understanding. Um, and, th and this caused issues. But really the majority of our cases do point back to Pakistan and the extreme blasphemy ideology that's emanating from, from there. Um, this is not the same in other European countries though. This is hinging on our diasporic makeup. So we have the largest South Asian diaspora sort of in Europe um, and our Muslim community is majority Pakistani. So the issues therefore that are affecting the diaspora from Pakistan are, are affecting our diaspora more than other other European countries. If you look at France, their blasphemy issues are more North African. Um, and if you look at Germany, you have issues that are prevalent more to do with the Turkish diaspora. But our issue is hinged on extremism that may be coming from Pakistan, according to our makeup of our diaspora. Um, and you you were asking how we asked me how we're dealing with the problem. Uh, so I just want uh, a little more emphasis on two points. Uh, the focus on the financial networks. Like, I mean, have you come across uh, any of uh, these things? I mean, uh, being routed in terms of financial networks to Pakistan, like the charities, are they raising money, or uh, and do they have links to Pakistanis, uh, Pakistan-centric terror groups or the extremist groups like Jamaat-e Islami, Hezbollah, yeah. Mujahideen? Because I remember in the US, uh, this uh, Middle East Forum did some work on that, and they did find a lot of charities having uh, tie ups with the groups like Lashkar e Taiba. I hope if, uh, I mean, there's not the same in the US, I'm sorry, in the UK, or if there is anything that you have come across, please tell us about it. And secondly, uh, to what extent this sentiment is also prevalent among the ordinary Muslims um, of the UK? So, yes. There is fundraising for extreme, what I would categorize as extreme anti-blasphemy organizations and movements in Pakistan, that the fundraising is happening in the UK. You only need to walk down some streets in East London and you will find collection jars for dawah e islami and jamaat e islami um, The extent to which money is moving is something that I'm not, uh, I don't have privy to that information. Um, but I think it's something that would be really interesting to uh, investigate. And I know a lot of people want to investigate that, myself being one of them, but it's about getting access to that information, um, which is really difficult to access. But you can just see the fundraising being done uh, on the streets of London. 
Um, you can also see this quite often coming about at events. We have annual coming about at conferences, um, again, where fundraising takes place. All of the websites, the UK based coming about website, Jamati Islami, there's a Tariq Lebake UK as well. There'll be donation pages. Um, so we know it's happening, but just how much money is something that you need access, uh, further access to that kind of information that I haven't got access to. Um, as for the wider Muslim community, I think. We've just so we've just had our census done um, and there was a lot of uh, concern. I don't think it was legitimate concern, but there was a lot of concern about the fact that now the Christian identifying community are in a minority um, are less than 50 percent. And we've seen a significant rise in those identifying as Muslim. Now, I think that this isn't a huge concern because the difference is muslims will identify as muslim even if they're non-practicing non-believing whereas christians who no longer believe in god will no longer tick the christian box so there's like an ethnic um islam as well whereas there isn't that for christianity so i think when you look at those that are identifying as muslim on the census and the numbers it is a distinct minority that are actually fundamentalist and practicing uh, and, and are extreme. Um, those that are sensitive about blasphemy, I think that actually is, lock, is, a, is a larger number, but those that are fundamental and think that someone should be violently attacked um, and uh, should be killed for blasphemy will be a much smaller number. And we're dealing with the same names over and over again, sort of to give a flavor for that. It's, it's always the same groups and the same mosques and the same names and the same sort of, uh, we have these journalistic platforms as well that are involved, one's called Five Pillars. It's the same people over and over and over again. It doesn't tend to go beyond that. And um, they're able to draw a good crowd for a protest, but you'll see people at a protest, but you won't hear and see from them again, if you see what I mean. Uh, so coming from this question, uh, you also mentioned in uh, this report that, uh, sorry, that I was reading one article in Guardian and in which your report was cited and you discussed about the protest outside the schools or, and uh, regarding the blasphemy issue. And you mentioned that uh, uh, this is different from the Salafi uh, Wahhabi style terrorism, but almost as dangerous as that. And, uh, so here the catch is that in Pakistan, mostly the people who, who are leading this blasphemy movement, they are, the, the Labak movement, they come from the Barelvi sect of the Islamic society. And Barelvis are regarded as Sufis, which is, you know, reportedly and, you know, so far considered to be moderately liberal. And uh, as compared to the Salafis and Wahhabis, they are regarded as uh, more amenable to uh, outside influences and they're more adjustable. But then we see that this whole blasphemy movement, you know, very aggressive blasphemy movement is being spearheaded by them. And in UK, it has emerged as a major threat. In India, it has emerged as a major threat. So do you see that about, about I mean, given this, you no, know, uh, the question arises that uh, whether it's a movement uh, uh, towards the Islamization of the society in UK or in Europe also, which is again, a big threat to the democratic values. Okay? And uh, I mean, we see that, you know, but there's not, you know, I would say any robust response from the government yet. I mean, is, is it just about tackling individual incidents or you are tackling uh, this whole problem as a major ideological offensive? against the democratic values. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're right. Um, it's been identified in the report that um, the extreme anti-blasphemy ideology is both hinging on Borelvism and Diabandism. Um, mm -hmm. When we look at Carmen Abawet, that's some kind of Diabandi, but then when you look at Tariq Lebeik, as you say, it's more Borelvi. Um, I think what the Home Office has missed is drawing the dots between the cases. So it's seeing each instant as individual. And when you start with um, the Rushdie affair, that's really cut across sects and the upset and the offense really spoke to a large section of Muslim youth about being defected in the UK and feeling like they had a place. This has become more, more of a clear ideology in and of itself. Um, that, as you say, is, is being pushed by certain organizations, political groups and movements, Kartman Ibawa, Tariq Lebe, Dawah Islami, Jamaat Islami from Pakistan. And what 
the Home Office is now missing is the necessity to break up the connections between these groups and movements and the UK. We've had a Tariq Lebeik um, hustings, like an encouragement for voting for TLP in Pakistan held in the UK. We have um, a TLP UK sort of presence. Um, their Twitter's been brought down recently, but they're always popping up. And then you have very clear Dawah Islami and Kartmi Nabawat organizations here in the UK. We had a, a mosque where uh, it, it's heavily connected to Kartmi Nabawat. It used to be called Kartmi Nabawat, but it's not anymore. Um, that had leaflets in there calling for the death of Ahmadis. Um, and I think what, what the UK government misses is the clear connections to the same groups. And this is something I call for in the report is the prescription of Tariq Lebeik, although it's something that Pakistan hasn't managed to maintain, we still could prescribe Tariq Lebeik, and then it would make it easy for us to stop certain preachers coming over and to ban certain organisations and charities and fundraising here in the UK. Thank you. Uh, and so again, you know, I would say I would just like to go back to your experience with prevent because I recently read a report. I, I unfortunately I don't remember the name of the report, but in that uh, uh, they discussed about uh, the all the uh, extremist groups in the UK and also about the Khalistan extremism. So there are two references in that book uh, in that report. First, the, uh, it was about prevent, and uh, it was mentioned that the prevent has not been a very successful strategy, like uh, as far as tackling Islamic extremism is concerned. And second, uh, regarding the Khalistani Sikh extremism, a uh, role of Pakistani uh, uh, apparatus was also acknowledged in that report. Uh, do, do you have any take on this? I mean, what do you uh, what do you feel about that? I mean, uh, uh, have yeah, you William. Come across yeah, this is William Shawcross's Prevent Review, which um, I contributed to with my experiences of, of Prevent as well. Um, I think that his review was spot on. I think that the UK frontline practitioners are concerned and nervous around tackling Islamist extremism because um, there is a general sense that if you are criticizing a minority group, you're being racist. And Islamists themselves have done very well to garner that narrative too. Um, so that makes people very concerned about tackling the issue. Um, and it, it can be really hard to get people to be confident and understand that we're talking about a distinct section, extreme section within the community. And actually the wider Muslim community are supportive. There was brilliant research done that showed, I think it was 70% or even higher of the wider Muslim community are supportive of prevent and concerned about Islamist extremism. So it, that though, is not being understood and people are being concerned that by getting involved in the work they're, they're being racist and I think a key example of that was the attack on the Manchester arena the Ariana, Ariana Grande attack um, the guard who was standing outside um, the concert hall saw um, the I think it's the it's ter it was Terrace Abadi I think it was um, in the hall praying an older man clearly not a part of the young girls who are going to the concert clearly out place concerning behavior considering the context and he didn't report the incident because he was worried about being accused of being uh racist and um, so that just really shows where although i think the prevent strategy in itself and what it's trying to do and how it's trying to safeguard people from being radicalized and how it works on tackling different forms of extremism is really good it falls when no one is confident enough to actually fulfill the strategy and implement it. Um, so William Shawcross's report was really saying, look, Islamist extremism is the biggest issue. We need to be brave about tackling it. We need, and we also need to understand that there are other forms of extremism that are lesser understood and a real issue. And that's right. He talked about Khalistan extremism. He talked about Kashmir related extremism, and he talked about his concerns of this becoming more of an issue. Uh, he didn't say this, but I think, my opinion particularly is that this will be more of an issue as we run towards the 2024 elections in India. Certainly, uh, definitely. Uh, in fact, I wrote one article on that uh, review also. You know, it was published here in the first post. And uh, once again, I mean, we feel that you know uh, this problem is uh, becoming like very serious in UK, but still in terms of response, there is some kind of hesitation. Just a few days back, you know, several churches were burnt in Pakistan. You know, the people were uh, killed, and uh, there was this huge mobs attacking the churches. 
in london in in uk you see there's this whole industry of kashmir separatists working very openly and freely but then here the indian strategic set of feels that you know uh, the action that uh, sub, that is supposed to be taken or that should have been taken against these groups or these networks working in the uk has not been taken sufficiently and certainly in the long run this is going to be very detrimental to the british democratic value yeah yeah i completely agree and and it's been uh, there's been more as well we had the attack on the indian high commission by a group of pro khalistani separatists as well yes. and that was considered not handled well enough by by the uk and i think we're at a risk from quite a few things here we're at risk obviously from our own risk to national security and radicalization extremism but also we're at risk here of damaging the india uk relationship which is very important for post brexit britain that needs to uh, rely on new avenues of trade um and also as india continues to grow economically tech technologically um so he's not gone without notice he just landed the first robot on the dark side of the moon so you know the there is an element to which the uk is failing to to notice this and respect properly india and the partnership that it should be looking to develop thank you now coming to another question which always becomes a little more sensitive in the indian context so here in india uh, uh, in the media and also among the strategic uh, experts who work on these issues they feel that there is some kind of a nexus between the left and the islamic extremists and uh, they always uh, uh, the left liberals or the leftist academics the intellectuals the media sections they are their attitude is very apologetic and they come out with some of the other defense uh, particularly and so this is the reason why they feel that there's some kind of a nexus uh, and do, do you think so like uh, do, do you come across such situations in uk in europe also or i mean what's the situation there we'd like to know more about it yeah yeah i mean i i find this absolutely fascinating and and i think there's quite a few layers to it um one is simple it votes there are certain parts of the uk that rely more on communal votes and that actually uh, is an area where i was doing my prevent work so i was in waltham forest which is in east london which relies heavily on a muslim community to vote um and i was working with the ahmadiyya muslim community at the time that were facing discrimination and i was asked by my local authority to stop that work in the run up to a local election because they were concerned that elements of the wider muslim community who were doing a lot of the campaigning and sort of controlling the vote in that area were not happy with the work i was doing from within the council and it could um compromise the the election for them so there is an element to which votes are, are an issue, but it's more than that because you see this uh, spread to areas that where the vote doesn't matter. So it is something psychological. Um, and I have done a comparison between how Germany treats uh, Islamist extremism versus how the UK is treating Islamist extremism when it comes to protecting Ahmadiyya Muslims. What I found really interesting, Germany is doing a much better job than the UK and I believe that to be because we have a post-colonial sort of psych where we have this hangover of like white man's guilt where there is a concern to get involved with minority issues because that would be seen as patronizing and condescending and that's the last thing this generation or even the generation above wants to do because we're in this sort of post-colonial trauma where there is a lot of guilt um whereas you look at Germany and Germany's historic psych is that of the Holocaust. And the last thing they want to do is be involved in supporting or allowing discrimination to take place. So they are really strict on Islamist extremism. They see it as something, as, as, as it is, something that is akin to Nazism, that is about saying this is the best way to think and everything else, um, it, everything else should be taken over essentially. So they see Islamist extremism more for what it is, and they want to protect the likes of the Ahmadis and the LGBT. It's no surprise that um, Berlin has the first LGBT all-inclusive mosque, whereas the UK has really struggled with that. Um, so I do think it's about our actual psychology as British people. And then I think it's votes. And then there's an element to which there's infiltration. So there are Islamists who have got into positions of influential political power in the UK. 
And the APPG, for example, on the on the Islamophobia definition is really pushed by those that have an agenda to say that Muslims are victims, they need to be protected, and that anything that's criti critical of uh, Islam as, as a religion is Islamophobic rather than critical as Muslim, Muslims as people. So we, we have this agenda that's being driven from people in positions of influence as well. So there is an element of infiltration. But yeah, this is a really good question and there's quite a lot that comes into it. Um, votes, infiltration and, and, a, and a psychology. Um, and the left, the left always wants to stand by that that it sees as the most oppressed. And um, Islamists have done very well as putting themselves forward as the most oppressed group, which also that causes people to be duped. Thank you. So uh, now let's come to more of the tactical part of uh, the extremism and its impact. So we uh, saw that lately uh, there was this upsurge in the lone wolf attacks in Europe mm -hmm. and uh, also modes of terror financing like to virtual currencies and all. But I mean, I was just wondering like if you work in this area, what kind of likely scenarios uh, resulting from such extremism do you expect in UK or in the other parts of Europe also? terror attacks or like very uh, severe mob violence uh, and uh, what are the effective solutions that uh, the governments in UK and Europe like uh, they, they can possibly come out with okay, tightening border controls or better intelligence or what's your team on this? So you, you're asking me what's the trajectory between lone wolf attacks versus group attacks? No, uh, I'm asking that as a result of this going extremism what are the likely fallouts in terms of uh, the results? Like, you know, do you expect more lone wolf terror attacks or organized terror attacks, or let's say very organized large scale mob violence in which they terrorize, intimidate, threaten people? So th these are three. I mean, uh, different yeah. outcomes. So I I expect all of that. Unfortunately, um, I expect that we will continue to see lone wolf attacks based on. Um, jihadist ideology and the idea of um, a, a future utopia um, and the hate for the West. I think we will continue to see that. Um, but we are seeing more and more online extremism sort of hinging around misogyny, the growth of a manosphere, um, and that is pulling in everything. It's like a, a sort of black hole that's that's pulling in all of these different hateful groups. So Andrew Tate has merged with Islamists merging with incels um, and, and incel violence is really something that is we're seeing more of. We've even seen that here in the UK. Um, so I think there's a concern about violent gun crime, violent individual crime based on frustration um, within men. Um, and I think that that is coming a lot from the online space. And I think we're gonna see more of that. I think we're going to see more communal violence as we continue to not actually do anything about the infiltration of extreme ideas, uh, particularly from Pakistan. And I think we're going to see a rise in pro Khalistan separatist agitation. Um, I think we're going to see a continued attempt to smear the Hindu community in the UK as Hindutva. And I think that we will see increased attacks on the Hindu community, therefore, and attempts by Islamists to spin this as. Uh, Hindu attacks on Muslims in self-defense. Um, and I think that that is going to become really critical for the India-UK relationship if we don't begin to understand that and confront that properly. And uh, if we continue to allow the narrative of Hindutva, we will see a real issue, I think, with the India-UK relationship. Um, but uh, And all the while, we will continue to see it. jihadist ISIS-inspired individual loan, loan attacks. I don't think we're going to see what we saw in 2014-15, I don't think we're going to see a successful establishment of a state that's going to draw people again. I think we've moved on from that, but we've also moved on from that in the online space. The online space is creating such uh, hostility and such speed with which ideologies are transforming and converging and merging. I mean, in the UK, we've started to just have a category which is now one of the most significant categories for prevent with the most cases in it. And that's the mixed and unclear and unstable category, MUU. And that kind of says it all because actually these ideologies are not mixed and unclear. You can see that they're converging. You can see that they're forming new ideologies. I think misogyny in itself is becoming an ideology of its own. Um, but things are happening so fast and merging. There's so much hate and so much violence that we're at the point now that we've just created a category which just goes, we don't know what it is and we're stuffing cases in it. 
Um, so I think um, there's there's going to be a lot and it's going to be everything. And a lot of that is because of the Internet and ideas being allowed to be accessed by all and converging. And the other is because the UK simply isn't handling the infiltration of ideas from abroad properly. Right, as you've uh, mentioned that, I mean, this is definitely, uh, there's a lack of, you know, robust action. Uh, I feel that uh, there's a very strong element of demography also in this, you know, and uh, I mean, with the way uh, the Muslim population, uh, is particularly the Pakistani diaspora, as you mentioned, there's the, uh, the largest, you know, segment of the Muslim population in UK, and this, you know, growing spread of uh, blasphemy uh, sentiment among the UK Muslim population. And also, uh, uh, given the fact that uh, this population is so huge that they are able to uh, send about 20 MPs, you know, because if we also combine the population of the Mirpuri, Kashmiri, Pakistanis, then it becomes a big number and they are able to send a significant number of uh, uh, parliamentarians. So with that, how would it be possible for the UK government to tackle all these things? Because uh, as you are mentioning, because the kind of radicalization shows that unless the governments do not enforce very strict codes, you know, like the way French people are saying that you, know, that you have to adopt a French lifestyle, French culture. Unless you don't stop that you, or you impose that, you, that you're not going to have such extreme speeches in these mosques or completely shut down such mosques, it's not going to work out. You know? And given the way uh, they have this strong political clout, it looks very difficult and unlikely. So uh, what do you feel like? You know, will the government be able to tackle it? Or we are just moving towards a very massive Islamization of the society and the government in UK? Yeah, I mean, I think that we do have an issue where um, extreme Islam, especially when it comes to blasphemy, has sort of taken tacit effect in the UK. And you'll find that people are censoring themselves and that it's entering into the general psychology of Britain that, that we have to respect um, Islamists, uh, really, because it's not respecting Islam, it's respecting Islamists. And that we have got to that stage already. Now, to wind back from that and to have a, um, a society that's based on independent freedoms and freedom of speech and protects all minorities equally, we need to garner voices from the Pakistani community that are speaking out against this. And, th and there are quite a few. So um, you may have heard Wasik Wasik speaking. He speaks out on issues quite a lot. Um, there are members of the Pakistani Muslim community that are involved in certain organizations as ones um I said the board of British Muslims for secular democracy um we used to have an organization called Quilliam um that's since dissolved there but there there's another one and, and I, it skips my mind um but they're all working on creating a pushback against the extreme narratives and again the the growth of sort of liberal and inclusive mosques across Europe. These are the sort of things that we need to encourage. And it's important that people see that, that they can see that there is a liberal Muslim voice and group, and therefore you can tackle extremism. If you see what I mean, if you have issues on the far left where they're worried about being seen as racist, if you can see that liberal Muslims are fighting against this, then you can see that you're not being racist. And I think that's really important to get a wider support of those people and those groups as well. Um, but I think, you know, whether to an extent we have already uh, internalized a, a, a respect for Islamism, which is a real issue. Absolutely right. We do need to have more organizations like Killiam Foundation. And we also, in a way, experimented with such organizations in Kashmir and other parts of India. But in my experience, I have found that most of the time, such organizations and such individuals who are talking about the defense of democracy or against blasphemy, they are seen as state proxies or the people working for the intelligence agencies. Uh, and they are more or less boycotted by the majority of the Muslim population. And yeah, but yes, they are respected, they are seen as uh, credible voices by the non-Muslims or the educated ones, but that doesn't uh, make much difference. Even a scholar like Javed Gandhi, he's a Pakistani scholar and he's a, he's a very you know, erudite and very serious scholar in Islam, but he's very he's marginalized. He is banished from Pakistan and uh, someone like Dr. Zakir Nayak, who is uh, 
outrightly inciting terrorist he's seen as a very credible and legitimate scholar uh, but that's it that's a scenario my last question and uh, my last question is that uh, so uh india uk definitely there's a very strong bonding friendship and but in the future uh, uh, do you see i mean what are the possibilities uh, for the cooperation on this counter terrorism and counter extremism front and uh, after that definitely you as a young researcher are uh, doing a great work and definitely you inspire a lot of youngsters you know, who want to work in this field so any message for the young people who want to work in the field of extremism terrorism radicalization two questions that's it. thank you um, so I think for the future of the India UK relationship, I think a lot of it is to do with tone. Um, and I think that there is a will, you know, Boris Johnson set forward the 2030 roadmap to greater cooperation and we were supposed to be seeing increased immigration. And, um, but then we saw Suela Braverman sort of do a 360 on that and, um, deny the want for more immigration from India. And I think um, I think she she's I mean, she's been reprimanded for that and she shouldn't have said that. And that wasn't in keeping with what actual government wants. And I think this is very problematic is that we have people in very high positions of influence contradicting each other. Um, but there is a core want and a sensible want for a good India UK relationship. Um, but I think there is still an air of arrogance in the way the UK goes about it. And, that, you know, I understand that Rishi Sunak, our first Hindu prime minister, still hasn't met Modi, whereas Macron has and Biden has uh, personally uh, met them, met Modi in person. Um, and I think this just sets the wrong the wrong tone. And I think that would be the, the place to start would be uh, Rishi Sunak actually meeting at Modi in person and that being a public event of, of solidarity and well-wishing of the relationship, that would be good. Um, and and just reiterating our 2030 wants and 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 having a coherent approach across government towards this and not having other more instances like Soever Braverman's. Um, and I think we need to understand India more. And that comes down to tone and approach, but there's a complete lack of understanding um, and an expectation that India as a democracy will work the same as the UK and not, no sort of acceptance or understanding that how large India is, um, how many different states with different characters are trying to be governed by one central body, which is very difficult, um, and the spanning of sort of time across different states. We've got some some areas that are living in one time zone, essentially like 100 years ago, and some that are putting robots on the moon. Um, so I think that that nuance and understanding is lost by the UK. And there's an expectation that India, as labelled as democracy, will be working in the same way as the UK. And then the UK demands that and, and it just lacks. It just lacks. Again, I come back to tone. It just is. There's just no attempt to understand and have a genuine respectful conversation. Um, and the UK is not in a strong enough position to behave like that anymore. So I think that I think that that's how I see it needing to go forwards. Um, and for those that want to go into counter extremism and counter terrorism, um, it's I I find it fascinating. I always have, and I came from it from a very human rights background. I did law, and then I went into um, a master's where I spe specialized on um, tackling genocide, which led me to look at counter terrorism because I see um, Islamist extremism as as really concerning for gen what, what we could see with regards to genocide in the future as as we have seen with the setup of of isis and um so that's where i came from and i think there are many routes in though um and there are those that are involved on a journalistic basis those involved in research basis those are involved in a legal basis and um, those that are involved in policing um, but for me, for my route, I think focusing on the government approach and then doing my own sort of work, going to Palestine, trying to understand things on the ground and then coming to it from a research journalist perspective. I've, I've really enjoyed every element of that. And now I feel like I have a good sort of holistic understanding of how these issues are tackled from government to journalists to research to uh, third sector. Um, so I guess my advice would be do what you enjoy, focus on the topics you're interested in and do work really hard, <laughs> put loads of hours in 
um and you know your passion will take you will take you there and that's what i would say thank you very much Charlotte. it was a really a great session and uh, we definitely learned a lot this is just a beginning of your relationship with osana's foundation certainly we look forward to see you more often in our youtube channel discussions and also for some of our conferences in india we would like to invite you to some of those conferences and uh, if you happen to be in india please do let me know i would like to catch up with you thank you very much once again for joining us today thank you, thank you so much thank you thank you so much ma'am for joining